Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, pleasure to be here and congratulations on a very nice building. Jealous. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so uh, this work is about um, <coughs> detecting botnets using, um, you know, sort of graph theory, a bit of graph theory. There's a lot of work on botnet detection using various mechanisms, and one set of mechanisms is people using their creativity and applying methods which are cannot be repeated with any other botnets because they're just creative people and they used things which are so specific to these botnets. Then there's some work on machine learning, a lot of work on machine learning. Uh, this one is using graph theory. Okay, <clears throat> Okay. so a quick introduction about botnets. Um, and you should feel free to just wave me off because, you know, these are standard slides at the beginning and, you know, you know what botnets are. I'll just skip the slide, right? So. Everybody knows what botnets are. Go through it very quickly. Okay, so essentially a coordinated attack platform. That picture there is just to show the complexity and the scale of operations involved. Um, average size could be anywhere from 500 hosts right up to a few million, but often it's above uh, 20,000. Most of the work is about you know doing DDoS or spam. And this third part is the information theft, yeah, which is more stealthy. So typical anomaly detection approaches don't work for this because you're stealing information, uh, not trying to stop somebody from doing something. So a lot of botnets are evolving towards peer-to-peer uh, -peer architectures. And the reason for this is, of course, that peer-to-peer uh, -peer architectures offer uh, a level of robustness. Right? They have theoretical proofs for different ways of organizing networks by which even a large fraction of nodes going offline doesn't really affect the functionality of the network. That's what peer-to-peer -peer networks are designed for. And uh, people, when they wrote these papers in the 90s and early 2000s, hoped that it would be into large-scale production. But things didn't go that way. But there are customers for that. And bot, bot masters have actually incorporated a lot of peer-to-peer -peer technologies into their code. And increasingly so, after a few families have taken in. Storm and Configure are one of the examples uh, for this. So very resilient to churn. Um, churn happens when nodes are taken down, ISPs shut down nodes, people turn off computers and so on. And they're scalable, um, very, very scalable um, um, so you uh, as well. Use these yes, yes, they use them. Yes, they use them specifically to overcome the problems of churn. Uh, which are is actually brought by a speech. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> the researchers should get that code. They that. should, they should really be. A lot of impact. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. A lot of impact. So you've got basically this uh, overnet uh, protocol which is based on Kademlia, for example. That's what Storm uses. It's got a bunch of worker bots and, you know, which are actually connected to each other using Kademlia. And then you have a bunch of proxies through which you come into the network and then a few, some layers of indirection basically. Uh, which could be classed as, uh, you know, basic anonymous proxy servers, and the bot master connects to them um, in turn. <coughs> so, uh, current approaches mainly around, you know, misuse detection. You have traffic classification-based mechanisms, um, with basically anomaly detection, for example, using PCA or whatever else that you want to do. Um, information theft is very hard to detect and zero day botnets again very hard to detect because you detect botnets based on them having carried out denial of service attack. Right? So if they are suicidal bots which are just used once for DDoS and then sold to somebody else for doing spam, you can't detect such things because there's sort of zero day in some sense. So single use bots, right? And then they're sold on the marketplace to somebody else. Or partition misuse, just use half of your network for the attack. So um, anomaly detection is based on threshold deviation. And essentially what will happen is in this case, each bot can fly under the radar, right? So if your threshold detection is a certain value, um, I just fly just below that. And I have huge numbers, so I can very well emulate you know, you get into the hard problem of distinguishing between a flash crowd and a denial of service attack. And that can be made very hard because of the huge numbers of bots we have in order to organize a malicious flash when crowd. You partition so you're saying you half your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Storm is about a few million. 
they don't need so much to carry out a DDoS attack. So if you want to attack VPC or something, okay. you just use 10,000. But if those 10,000 are detected and taken down? It doesn't, don't care. Then use the next 10,000. You are in business for a while. So just a pipeline? You know, a pipeline. Well, pipeline of batch mode sort of. Yeah. <clears throat> So then there's the traffic analysis, so no, sorry, machine learning approaches which I talked about. Um, but uh, then based on content if you're doing, you're going to slow down the routers because if you switch on NetFlow with all the features turned on, you're going to slow the routing down at peak traffic loads. Besides your traffic could be encrypted, so you know, doing content based filtering, something that's not really wants to do, uh, becomes difficult. That's not all that Smart Snort does. Snort also does things like, oh, let's look at the bit patterns, but then, you know, it's very easy for me to change my bit patterns. I don't have to change my application's architecture for changing the bit patterns on the wire. So it's very easy to fool these simple detection mechanisms, right? Okay. So, um, just a quick uh, reflection on this. So early botnets were centralized because they're easy to manage easy to take down and therefore people are going for structured peer-to-peer -to -peer topologies uh, with provable resilience properties. So botnet design now becomes a, um, an optimization on or uh, you want to maximize your availability and you want to maximize your resilience, right? But we're bringing in a third parameter which is namely stealth. The point that I'm trying to make in this presentation is that stealth is one thing which you do not get when you incorporate peer-to-peer -peer topologies. And the background intuition for that, uh, for this idea, is that if you were to inject a Kademlia, it looks very different from a scale-free graph or, you know, client-server network. So if you have a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology thrown into this large set of client-server interactions, you lose stealth. You may gain in resilience, but you lose stealth. That's the hypothesis which I will try to put an argument for. Unstructured as well, yes. Unstructured, but you know, I mean, um, they do unstructured peer-to-peer, -peer, no, no doubt about it. Uh, but there are also some s hybrid unstructured um, uh, topologies with provable properties. By hybrid, I just meant heterogeneous. Like if you look at the degree distribution of each node, unlike core, it won't be uh, the, a fixed num number, but it's heterogeneous. When you say unstructured, mm -hmm. what about hierarchical? Which have one yeah, yeah. So this diagram, if you see, right? Right. It's you a hybrid that of level. that. Yeah. Uh, what I'm asking is, uh, like BitTorrent or something like that, which is unstructured. Yes, it's theory, unstructured. But yeah. it's got this hierarchical structure. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Uh, do botnets exist which have this unstructured well, it, but hierarchical it, it nature? Well, it depends. So for command and control, see what I've seen for Storm uses this, and what's happened is because it's so successful, the rest of the guys have just copied the code. So Kademlia and Overnet protocol is the basis for most of the botnet operation, right? Increasingly. But there are people who use BitTorrent or who use its predecessors in order to get, it, get, get their job done. If what they're trying to do is getting information, stealing some information and uploading, well, you just take and upload in a bunch of other places. And then so the attacker is, picks it up using BitTorrent, for example. The storm is a botnet <coughs> under the control of one entity, is it? Yes. Was, was, now it's well, kind it's of. Down. But there are others which have taken its place because they have the code, you s share it in social network forum, and everybody else copies. Okay, so here's the problem that we wish to solve. Um, so you've got all this client server traffic, right? What you see in um, one color, and you've got these black uh, nodes which are bot infected hosts. Our objective is to partition the graph, it's a graph partitioning problem, into, you know, um, this client-server traffic and the peer-to-peer -peer traffic, right? Okay, so this is, for example, a, a chord topology there, quite a dense one for a chord. Um, so, very simple, right? Simple graph partitioning problem, that's all there is to it. The important point, though, is there's no min cut existing between the partitions. Um, so you've got hosts which are talking to Google and talking to Hotmail, and the same hosts are also infected by bots. And um, anywhere between 10 to 25 percent of the network's edges may be between bot nodes and non-bot nodes. Right? Bot nodes also support. There are, you know, when you say bot nodes, they're really just bot edges and non-bot edges. 
That's all you have. So it's in fact an edge partitioning problem. Okay, uh, so in comparison to previous graph theory work, in this the problem is that there's no main cut that you have. So when you apply community detection or any of these things, never works for that reason, because there's no main cut. Listen, so when you are saying uh, these botnets are using structured future theory, and when you are trying to sort of create the partition, uh, yeah. one of them is not non-bots, and then the other is the bots. Uh, do these bots also include the part, the, the applications that are using structured peer-to-peer -peer networks for valid reasons? And if so, are you trying to make a distinction between the valid uses of these structured p 2 p networks and invalid uses? Yes. Yes, yes. So the answer to that is the, the basic algorithm allows you to, um, <coughs> to partition. So in this vanilla version, the algorithm which I'll describe just detects structured peer-to-peer -peer graphs without knowing whether it's botnet or not botnet. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to Starting from a small subset of bot nodes, find the rest of the bots which belong to the same subgraph. Okay? So if you're running a few bots on a honey net, you'll find the rest of the bots on the internet starting from there. So if you want to do botnet detection using the technique, you'll need a honey net. I'll come to that. So how long does it take to create this full graph these Takes a while. Takes a while. They have to find enough nodes and you know, nodes come in, nodes go out. It's a constant process. That depends on the botmaster skill. How well no, can no, you, in fact, compute us? Just to get your uh, basic graph, that the one in the middle. So this? Then, yeah. So this is um, recorded okay, at an ISP. This is recorded at an ISP. Okay. Sorry. Um, so trace routes or something? Oh, no, this is NetFlow. This is all oh, NetFlow okay. traces. Okay. ISP level NetFlow traces. Okay? All right. Okay. <laughs> so what is really a botnet? Informal description. So what you're looking for is you're looking for evidence of collaboration between nodes where we don't expect any. Okay? You have three sets of information. You have who talks to whom, right? The connectivity patterns between the computers. You have how they talk to each other. That's what actually machine learning locks on to. And then you have when they talk to each other. These are the three sets of information you have. Now, what we are trying to do in this paper is just taking who talks to whom information and trying to find out where the botnet is. Obviously, that's an incomplete uh, approach uh, because we don't use entire set of information. Partly why you have uh, the situation that you detect all structured botnets and also applications. Okay. <coughs> so here's our architecture. So you've got the host level communication graph, you've got traffic monitors on the network, you've got these uh, routers there running NetFlow traces, right? And that's what we're capturing, that's what gives you that big green graph in the middle. The second part is we've got a misuse detection system where we've got a honey net with a few seed, um, seeded with a few samples of the malware we're interested in detecting on the wider internet, okay? And then this goes to the inference system, <coughs> this information. And the inference system outputs a bot graph and then the background graph. So that's the high level um, idea. So when you say few, uh, how, yes. many are, how many are you talking about? Ooh, five, six is all you need. So what is five, six? Uh, you, five, six is the number. You're running bots on your own malware testbed. Just to attract? Not to attract, okay. but to belong to part of the botnet. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is where your search will start from. So when you identify other uh, internet hosts that are infected, uh, I'm guessing you can only identify nodes that are within the ISP at which you are collecting net traces, or can you identify nodes even outside the network? No, it will be within the uh, within the ISP. In fact, uh, I'll come to that. But we make some rather grand assumptions. It won't work at the single ISP's level. You need more. Okay. <coughs> So, d uh, is everybody comfortable with random walks? Because I'm going to use that quite a lot. No, I prefer to walk. <laughs> That's good. That's excellent. Okay. But you won't find botnets that way. Yeah, okay. So, random walk, starting from a single node, you go to all various other nodes, you know, have a transition probability, write that down like a matrix. And then you can, what you can do is you can compute the probability where you will be after um, n steps by um, an algebraic equation like that. And this 
tells you a lot of information about uh, what kind of topology you have. So you can study topologies using random walks. So in other words, we have got a graph, you can study it using this equation. Okay, <clears throat> so what do we do? So we have got a big graph. Our approach is the following. So we perform the first step of the algorithm um, called bot grep is to perform a single random walk which is of medium size, about log n size. So we've got one million nodes, you'll do a walk about six or twelve steps. Right? Then you look at the state probably mass distribution. Now our hypothesis is that if you've got a structured expander graph or a structured peer-to-peer -peer graph like Kademlia or Cord, then when you start a random walk from anywhere on the internet, the state probably mass associated with the peer-to-peer -peer nodes will be similar to each other. So if you have got a random, I've got a Kademlia graph here, it's the whole wide internet. Start a walk from everywhere with equal probability. What I'm saying is, all these nodes out here in front of me will have similar probability mass, state probability mass associated with them because of that topology. Okay, so let's see whether that's actually true. So what I have here is basically that graph. Let me just, I said that all you have to do is a single walk, but you have to do a little bit more than that. Let me just describe what is actually done. Here's a Kaida data set with about 4 million nodes, and I started a random walk. The x-axis doesn't matter. I started a random walk with, um, uniform probability dis with uniform probability, 1 over n, and this is the distribution that you get, right? Now, it has an embedded, synthetic embedded peer-to-peer -peer botnet. That means what? That means that if I have this um, Kaida data set, I've got the Kaida data set with 4 million nodes or 50 million edges or something. I go and add about another uh, 5,000 or 6,000 edges, which are two existing nodes, which are in the Kademlia topology or chord topology. So I go and add chord edges to an existing um, graph that I got from Netflow traces. Okay. And then I did a random walk. <clears throat> the main intuition here is the topology is closely related to Markov chain properties. That's okay. That's a well-known thing. But the new part is you're able to separate the subgraphs based on their relative Markovian mixing properties. So what's happening is you start the random walk from a peer-to-peer -peer node, or as soon as a walk enters a peer-to-peer -peer node, it will reach its part of the stationary distribution much, much faster because it's called, it's designed for that, rather than the background graph. Just because you entered a node that's part of the chord ring, for example, mm -hmm. does it mean that you're going to stay within that ring as you do a random walk, right? You might exit and then go. You might exit and go. So, uh, you might exit and go. So what is the intuition for why things will start behaving differently the moment you... Uh, so let's consider a chord graph in its isolation. Just a ring. Just a ring, thousand so nodes, with, so the with all the fingers and all that. Okay. Right? You, if you start a walk in this graph, you know, it will reach a stationary distribution at a particular speed. So many steps, and the, you you could be anywhere else on the road. Normalized right? by the number of nodes, or something. Just the stationary distribution. How in how many steps could you be anywhere in the graph? Okay. Right. Log in steps. Yes. We know that. So in log in steps, starting from any node in a chord ring, you could be anywhere else. Now you take the same set of edges embedded in a large internet, hundred million node graph, right? So the nodes have chord edges and non-chord edges. And you start the walk. A walk that enters the chord ring can exit the chord ring. But assuming that it exists within that, if you're just taking the algebraic version of this to calculate, the walks starting in the chord ring will reach that part of the stationary distribution very fast. Okay, let's draw a figure. <coughs> so let's suppose the stationary distribution of What's the stationary distribution of chord? It's basically just that, flat. Okay. You There's the probability. At any one of the nodes. Pro you likelihood you're at any one of the nodes after n steps. Okay. okay? There's the that's the probability. P of t. Let's put it. Okay. So this this doesn't have any axis. It's just the any sequence of nodes basically. Now, if you just take the internet and uh, take a scale-free graph, take a large scale-free graph then you know your stationary distribution is essentially your degree distribution whatever it is right now this stationary distribution you may reach after 
um, because it's a scale-free network, uh, to reach a stationary distribution, it takes a long time. This takes, if this reaches this in log n steps, this is probably going to take, uh, you know, maybe at best uh, at 10 log n or uh, actually it's just much, 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 much more than that. Um, <coughs> Much, much more than that. The point is, this ray reaches its stationary distribution much, much faster than this graph does. So when you have the situation that you have got this internet and then you have this call ring which is densely connected, and you're now looking at the stationary distribution of the combined graph, now suppose that that distribution is something like this and this is the part that corresponds to the chord ring. Then in the first step, you know, what is the probability distribution? This is the probability distribution, let's suppose, at step five. Um, in the first, in the zeroth step, everybody is at zero. What I'm saying is, this set of nodes will reach their part of the stationary distribution, that means this much probability mass, in about approximately log n steps. Whereas all these others will take much, much longer. Do you assume that you know what the uh, eventual distribution is going to be? Or? We don't know. But whatever it is, the subset, subgraph of chord nodes will reach its part of the stationary distribution much faster than the rest because that's what they're designed for. But how do you know that it's reached? It stops yeah. changing, I guess. Sorry? How do you know that it has reached its stationary distribution? How well, you can. Stop? How long? How do you know when to stop? Or well, you can go for. You can go for how long, however longer it takes for the larger graph. So let's suppose that it takes n log n steps. For example, you can go for n log n steps and you'll see that these guys stop changing after log n steps. That's what you'll see. Okay. Yeah. Is there some implicit assumption about the fraction of edges that are part of the chord ring and the fraction of non chord edges for a given node? Like, do we have to know in advance how many? You have to know in advance how many, and if it's widely different that you have, you know, thousand times more non-chord edges than chord edges, then does that affect your convergence rate? No. So we don't need to know how many chord nodes are there, how many chord edges are there. We don't even have to know what the size of the network is. So if you already have chord edges in the existing the other topology, right. Oh yeah, yeah. You are going to lock on to not only card. You are going to lock on to any structure topology, including Skype. All of them will be found, and then you have to run hypothesis tests to why this is a botnet. That's why we have the. That's why the this one comes. So this anyway, done using any like after after this, you'll have to take into consideration what he was saying, which is the probability that walk starting from card nodes can leak outside, and they will also have appear like they have very good probability masses just like the chord nodes that will be their false positives right and then you'll have box which started from other places that entered those are also your false positives you'll have to take care of that but the second step after once you have this is your hypothesis after you located the hypothesis you'll have to prune that using some clustering technique and I'll mention one of them but you can put anything in its place okay so <clears throat> that's the result of a single medium length walk log in steps Okay, you can't really see very much from it in terms of what I was describing on screen there. Now what we do is a um, bit of a bias removal filter. We know that nodes which have very high degree obviously attract a lot of walks towards them. The first step we do is we divide by the degree of each node. The probability mass deposited on each node is divided by its degree. What we are interested in are subsets of nodes which don't have a high degree but seem to have a fairly high uh, probability mass associated with them because that's what you know expanders do but a star node client server type you know Google connected to its neighbors expands much much faster than even card so those nodes will have a huge amount of probability mass associated with them. those are the big server nodes up there the hubs but you won't find a lot of hubs sitting together to form a botnet hypothesis for you so the first step is that so what we're doing is QP this is your random walk divided by the degree then I'm subtracting by the mean and raising it to the power of 1 over k. What this does is subtracts the mean and then sort of zooms out the um, probability mass p of t from the mean. And then you get a picture like this. All these nodes are essentially the bot nodes, these ones. 
Okay. So, um, but they can have false positives and um, so on, right? So we'll we'll have to look at how to remove those things. So on top of this, this is just showing one button. So there's there's, there's a mask there and there's the one below it. Yes, yes, yes. So those are all hypotheses we'll have to clear off. At this point, we haven't detected any. So now you apply a simple k-means algorithm. K-means means you have to specify k, replace it with x means you don't have. It's a non-parameterized clustering technique. Um, very simple. And you know it gives you something of that sort. And now each band is basically a what are you clustering? candidate. We are clustering on P of T, the probability mass associated with you. That's what we are clustering on. OK? So here you see some nodes with very high masses. You can see about three bands at least. And you were saying you could also notice bands. I can see about three to four bands. Each of these bands is essentially a structured graph candidate. The first, you know, you apply a basic graph connectivity test. That is, extract the subgraph corresponding to these and see if it's connected. If it's not even connected, you don't have a hypothesis at that point. Right? And once you have got a graph, then you can look into whether it's well formed or it has its, uh, the property that a structured graph should have and so on and so forth. OK, so what we do is, yes, question. This one? That's, I think, um, let's say there is not one. I don't remember now. I had worked it out at that point. I don't remember now. Sorry. OK. <clears throat> so what we have to do now is each graph now has, is, 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 you get a graph corresponding to each of these bands, right? For each color. I don't uh, see whether they're grouped together or not grouped together because this x-axis doesn't make any sense. This could be just be a dense cluster which is uniformly distributed if you took another sequencing arrangement. So each of them is, is, is a potential botnet at this point, And we have to evaluate whether it has all the properties that our expander would have. And if so, that's interesting. But still not a botnet just because it's structured. So at this point, uh, what we, I'll introduce the second part of the step. So far, we have seen the pre-filtering step. So the second part is the recursive partitioning step. And essentially, what we're trying to do in this is we're trying to find um, it's a fine-grained uh, version of what we've just done. So <coughs> we're trying to find, given a, set of, given a set of random walk traces, we are trying to find which subset of those nodes is a peer-to-peer -peer for, for each of the bands. Right? So given a set of random walk traces, what's the probability that um, a subset x is actually peer-to-peer, -peer, which when applying Bayes' theorem, um, is the probability that starting from a set of peer-to-peer -peer nodes, you get a certain type of traces multiplied by our a prior probability that a set of nodes are peer-to-peer, -peer. okay, divided by a normalization constant. So herein is your where you plug in your a prior idea of whether you know that these set of nodes are actually malicious nodes or not, malicious peer-to-peer -peer nodes. For the purpose of this algorithm, whether or not this is a peer-to-peer -peer node, it doesn't need to know it's malicious. It doesn't care. The equation doesn't care. So is this node peer-to-peer -peer or not, right? And then um, we need to find this, this, this amount. If I can get this, I know this. This is my a prior input. Otherwise, it's uniform 1 over n. Um, then I can compute this. Find which subset of those nodes in the band is actually peer-to-peer. -to, -peer. to compute this, we do a number of short random walks. And the idea is, if you do a really long walk, right, then you could start from somewhere outside the peer-to-peer the -peer subgraph, and you could come to the peer-to-peer -peer subgraph and exit and go somewhere else. But if you do a large number of short walks, the likelihood that happens is very little. Right? So you've got this, <coughs> that's your little botnet there. So you're going to do a um, large number of short walks starting from various points in the, um, in the graph, including this. So if you start a walk within the cord um, subnetwork, then it's very likely that it will remain within because it's short. Short, short means three, or um, log n. You can keep it as log n. Okay. So uh, I think in the previous case we used a much larger value. It was used n log n or something of that sort. Anyhow, a single random walk of length n log n in the pre-filtering step 
and several short walks of length log n in the in the second step. So then you're going to get this value, right? Plug it in, and you're going to. So could you repeat how you exactly compute this? This value. So a prior probability is computed by running those samples of those malware in your own test bed. So when I capture traffic from my traffic monitors, that will include the traffic from my malware test bed. So that's part of the graph that I. So to to do this part, um, that that's how I compute it. I know it. I injected them. Any of those candidate uh, structured graphs that you get, right? X is that. Whereas you are, onion is a very small uh, set of nodes. Onion is a very small set of nodes. This is five or six. I'll tell you why that's really important. It helps with the random walks actually. So now I'm saying that you can, if you don't know what that is, you just start the walks from, you keep it as one over n. Everybody could be peer to peer or has yeah, the equal probability, right? And then you you just have this value that you can cluster upon. So you could view this Bayes implementation as a clustering algorithm that from each node I do a random walk, I get a vector of uh, n points, and then I cluster those points. It's just the Bayesian way of doing it. So X is a node, right? Sorry? X is a node in the network? X is a machine? It, that's a random variable here. Yeah, but it, because what I'm saying is uh, the intuition here is you're saying given uh, sort of, uh, a set of traces, what is the probability that you try to calculate the probability that a given node is part of a peer to peer? Right, right, right. Yes, yes. So I, I didn't understand the one over n thing you said that. Basically, a node can either be a peer to peer node or not, right? Yeah. So there are two possibilities. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Not one over n. So half, 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 half. No, okay, half. that's nonsense. Half. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is reasonably clear. Right? Another view of this for those who are from machine learning area is that from each um, node you start a, a log n walk and you get a probability distribution that has n elements. Now you cluster all these uh, n dimensional vectors and then you'll get your uh, peer to peer part out of it. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the third step is to have a set of validation tests. And uh, you look at the conductance of the partition, for example, and uh, you look at the homogeneity of the degrees, it fast mixing, things of that nature, which are, you know, uh, standard features of uh, cord like uh, networks. And that confirms that you've got a structured peer to peer graph. Doesn't say anything about the botnet yet. Okay, so, <clears throat> so much about the theory. Um, I'll go and show you some um, figures on how it actually works. And any questions about the theory so far? X there, is it a node or is it a subgraph? It looked, I mean, initially I thought it's a subgraph, but now you're saying it's a node in the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, I thought X was that candidate subgraph sub that graph. you extract from the... No, no, no. That is extract. Now that has become a graph for the purposes of this page. That is the whole graph. From that whole graph, I do a random walk from each node within that graph. And then I get these traces, T. And then I'm looking at the probability of whether, for each node, whether it's part of the peer-to-peer -peer or it's not part of the peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. So the the subgraph from step one is now a graph for step two. The whole graph is is here. Okay. <clears throat> so step three is basically validation tests after you've found. So this this is a mechanism for finding high conductance subgraphs inside your graph when you don't have min cuts separating them that's what this this technique does okay so this is a reminder of what it, what we had in the beginning um, essentially the detection metrics are false positives and detection percentage and hopefully false positives sufficiently low then even if this is not very high you can have a workable mechanism the first part of our experiment is uh, abelian data set from 2009 or something, yeah, 2009, yeah. And uh, that has 104,000 nodes and, you know, uh, half a million edges. There's also a Kaida one. Where was the data gathered? I mean, how many points of presence did you have? Uh, I think two routers. So we had two routers, uh, Chicago and Kansas. Core Chicago routers. and Kansas, yeah, core routers. Core routers, NetFlow, from single ISP, right? And then what we have done is we have added 
cord edges to that ourselves to because we need ground truth. Oh, I see. So <coughs> it's, a oh, I it's a synthetic embedded cord. Uh, this one, and then we are trying to so detect the it out. that you get from just these two points of presence, one ring and these two points of presence itself is quite incomplete, right? It is incomplete view not so only of the so ISV but also of the internet. Say you were able to <coughs> successfully separate out your chord graph from such a graph. You can't really make a claim that this would actually work in the real thing because uh, once you have more edges that come from more additional more monitoring points, then uh, things can get more complex. Huh? Mm. So you have. Um, so what you're saying is the size of this this outside graph, right? So, so you have essentially a very narrow view of, 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 the, of the real communication graph, right? Yeah. So you only monitored these two points. Right. And now you're saying that if you have this other sort of graph embedded which has these different properties, you can it stands up. Yeah. But if the sort of base graph are richer and more complete, mm -hmm. then. Uh, so we have tied up. That's why we have a bigger one. That's four million nodes. That's coming later. So this is a bit of a toy one because it's only so. <coughs> so one of the things we want to point out here is, uh, so theoretically speaking, you that's one point. The other point is uh, the assumption we are making here is sort of that you need uh, you know you need to be able to view a significant amount of the ISP traffic in the world, right? But it turns out that that you don't need to do that because uh, significant amounts of the ISP traffic actually transits very few tier one ISPs. That, that that's probably not a surprise to this audience, right? So, 60% <coughs> of the paths is visible to just tier one ISPs. If you look at the percentage of storm IPs in Kraken Bot Lab, uh, uh, Kraken is another botnet. The percentage of uh, IP addresses seen at the top ASS, you know, you, the top 10 ASS are seeing about 80% of the botnet traffic. So, if you can get the cooperation of a top couple of ISPs. Then you have a sufficiently. Oh, is huge, right? so it is. It you is. have to monitor lots of places within that area. It's not just sort of. Yes, yes, so yes. But in terms of the scale of the monitoring, you'd have to do it. Scale of monitoring is large. Obviously, you are saying that you know you have. Uh, getting an agreement with someone. Yes, yes. The number of parties you have to get an agreement from is not that big. And also, the second thing is that for each um, uh, this thing flow, you only need source and destination IP addresses because we don't use anything else here. Right? So we are not using any of the other time or protocol or any, we don't use that information. Okay, so here is the result of the detection. Um, so there are three candidate graph topologies that we embedded. De Bruin is uh, one of the optimal expander graphs that we have. There's Cardemblia and there's Cord, different sizes. These are embedded from 100 to 10,000. So that's about, you know, 10,000 is 10% um, of that, right? And so you can work out the other ones. And the false positive ratios about zero for De Bruyne and uh, you know uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.1, 0 0.0 to 0 0.1 for the other ones. And uh, what this means is basically the false positive number, reasonably manageable, right? Yeah. So the, the original graph that you had, is mm. Mm. Did you, did you first draw these algorithms to see how much of a structure they want that already exists. True. So if, the, if that is much higher, then we have a false positive. I'll come to that. I'll come to that. See, what you have, you'll find all the botnets, right? But what you won't find is so when you run bot grep, you it'll the output will be that okay, here are your expander graphs, right? Now it doesn't lump all the nodes which belong to any expander graph together. All the nodes that belong to a single expander graph are clustered into if you have three different expander graphs embedded, you'll get three different subgraphs. Okay, so four, three graphs, and then the background. That's the partition that you get, and then you have to figure out whether uh, there is any information that you know which makes you believe that uh, you know uh, the the partitions that you have are actually a botnet. That's why you have to run your malware test bed, because you'll find your nodes only in one partition. Right? So you found three partitions here. Result: If you had three expanders, you have three expanders, and then you have got this three big background graph that you got. Your malware nodes are only in this, so that's your graph. So this is a botnet. There is aren't. There may be a botnet, but from your perspective, there aren't because those are not the samples you're after. Okay. How do you quantify the false negatives? Is that the last column? That's the last column. Yeah, the detection percentage. How do you know? How do you quantify the false negatives? I mean, that would be this, right? The total number of the total bot size minus what you detected is false negatives, right? 
what size is the number of vertices? Yeah. Okay. We can't calculate this no, without the. Uh, okay. There is there is a bot graph, a sub graph, we embed the larger graph. Yeah. And you're not able to find it. It's a mm -hmm. false negative, right? If you don't find it, yeah, it's a false negative. But then you will not know because uh, you know. No, no, we we injected it, right? See, see, in uh, the, the current case, we are synthetically injecting to compute these figures. Okay. This is synthetic. So far, it's synthetic, right? Okay. So there's a percentage of nodes that are detected. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't okay. embedding a synthetic graph change the properties of the original detection? I mean, kind of like that. If that graph was actually in there, then you might have seen a different original graph, maybe because of congestion or some of the connections. No, the assumption is that expanded graphs are not likely to exist in the original graph. No, that's a no, no. They can exist in your original graph. This will tell you what expander nodes your malware, malware test bots belong to. That's what it tells you. Well, they are just not the same as the original. No, the original graph might look different if there was really a bot engine there. No. Okay. Uh, so let me go through the experiments once. What's okay. the intuition for cause first is going high when the number of nodes are increasing? I would yeah. assume that uh, your detection would be much better. So when you have a lower number of nodes, basically if you're, the way the, uh, the embedding is done is that you're assuming that nodes are infected at random, right? There's no special. So if you have a scale-free graph, which is what your background graph is, when you choose 100 nodes, more likely, very le unlikely that you choose hubs. Whereas when you choose 10,000, sample 10,000 nodes, chance that you get a hub is slightly higher. And if you have a hub node that's infected, random walks leak out of the hub very quickly, out of the cord and onto the background graph. I think there's some confusion in the labeling here. Sorry? Number of nodes is 100,000, 100, right? Yes. This is also labeled as number of nodes. This is actually the number of random walks you did. Uh, no, no, no. This is the sub size of the botnet, embedded oh, botnet. Okay, embedded botnet. Embedded botnet is this one. So 10% to 1%. So that's the idea. So the top fee is the background when the big okay. Which one? Yeah, that's the background. This is the embedded. Right? Uh, how, sorry, maybe I missed the point, but how do you embed this botnet? Do you choose nodes that are already in this? Yes, we choose nodes which are already there. And then, you and then connections we add just edges. Yeah. Copy the structure. Correct. Correct. So we just add edges. We don't add any nodes. And you don't remove any edges from those. We don't remove any edges. No, 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 no. So the only embedding part is adding core edges or adding De Bruyne edges, that's all. Okay, <coughs> so there's another um, um, variant of CORD which came out in um, um, this paper in this conference, LEAT, uh, that's what I call it, LEAT CORD. And uh, this has the property that, uh, um, so LEAT CORD has a, is, is basically a heterogeneous graph, right? It has actually um, slightly different, it's not that good expansion properties. Uh, I think I have a graph for, uh, yes, so here is lead cord versus cord. It's the percentage of failed nodes and you can see the percentage of failed paths along. So cord has a much lower failure rate as compared to lead cord does, right? So lead cord is much less of an expander, has much less resilience, but it's heterogeneous. Now let's look at what happens for here. Uh, you have called here, the false positives are up there, 0.13 for 10,000, which increases quite a lot to 0.5% for lead card of the same size, right? So this demonstrates to you that detection rate is sort of similar. That detects, that shows basically that introduces far more false positives than card. So you have resilience on one hand with card, and you have stealth with lead card. So that's the trade-off that you're ending up making, right? That's what this particular graph shows. Okay, so core has resilience, lead core doesn't, but lead core has lower detection rates, sorry, higher false positive rates. Okay, <clears throat> so the second one is um, uh, effect of background size, which is what uh, uh, you're raising a question about. So we got the CAIDA data set, which is much, much larger in size, right? And um, I don't know how many places it was collected from right now but that's the size, so much more representative than a small 100,000 node graph. And you have you know, the same experiment which you run, 
about 98 percent detection and about uh, 0.12 to 0 0.06 um, false positive rates, fairly manageable false positive rates. If once it crosses about this is again with embedding. Same, same experiment, just the background change, graph is changed. It's also a synthetic botnet at this point. So, uh, okay, so the other one we did was, uh, you know, trying to show the scalability of the algorithm uh, somewhat. So the algorithm is, uh, it's actually a order of n log n algorithm. And we're just trying to scale up the synthetic chiral a little bit to have a bigger graph. So what we did was, um, you know, you start off with a graph like this. You, you make multiple copies of the kind of data set. You, you know, make sort of two copies. Okay. Uh, okay, so you, this, the graphics are messed up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so you take these two edges. Okay, so this, this is a copy of, you take two copies of the kind of data set. And uh, you take an edge and its counterpart edge, right? Because it's a copy, it'll always have a counterpart edge in the other copy. And then you rewire them so that now this one is going to be talking to its counterpart, not D. It will talk to D in the first graph, and this guy will talk to D in the other graph. So you just rewire it like that. You go across. Okay? So that when you do, you get a larger graph with the same statistical properties as the smaller kind of graph, just numbers are higher. So in that, um, when we do the embedding, the false positive rates, again, they fall massively and the detection percentage increases. And this is, again, the effects of sampling, really, rather than anything else. Right? But the point I was trying to make is not that the false positive is very low, but that it runs within the hour. Um, not at the hour. It rather takes about 10 minutes to run on this, the algorithm. <coughs> okay. Right, uh, so we also did a comparison with community detection techniques. There are a number of them. This is what grab our current algorithm. It's between S modularity and um, there's also a hybrid between modularity and random walk. And you see that, uh, you know, for the same size, we took a dense 2000 node subgraph. The reason for taking a smaller, just a 2000 node graph, is that these are all so non scalable, you can't run them on size of graphs beyond 2000 or 5000, right? So if you run 30 million, is just not possible. They're all n square log n are the most efficient versions that uh, I was able to find. So if you run these, there are scalable ones. sorry, there are scalable ones now. Okay, for between us, uh, no, for general modularity, basically. for modularity, but that's fast greedy. That's an approximation. It's greedy, yes. Yeah, it's greedy. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is this this one. So this was actually okay. We could scale this up much more, but this one and that one. That one probably could be scaled. This one wasn't. It's between S based. I think it goes into N square log N. Um, okay, so that's the false positive rates. You can see for De Bruyne, 0.78, 19, 14%. That one is much more manageable, but its detection rate is just 46% instead of close to 100% that the others have, 80, 90% at least. So for CARD, again, you know, you see the uh, similar sort of thing 6%, um, 7%, uh, whereas we are sitting at about 0.7, so one order of magnitude less of false positives. <coughs> Same for Kadamlia. Okay, so community detection algorithms actually, you know, uh, it outperforms, but that's not so much an issue with community detection algorithms. They expect min cuts. There aren't any in the graph, so they don't find it. How many botnets uh, did you inject in your evaluation? Just one. Just one. Yeah. Did you try injecting peak topologies? Well, we didn't try to do three topologies at a time. Like, three topologies at a time overlapped or non-overlapped? Anything like that. So we had some, see, with Kademlia, we found some 1,000 node, 2,000 node structured botnets, structured graphs already inside. Because, as Venkat was saying, it's more representative. And so they were there. It finds them, chops them out separately. We didn't inject, but they were there already. Sorry? Bot grab takes in a seed set of known bad bots, right? That's to tell that it's a botnet, not to tell that it's a structured graph. No, but you use that to do the random sampling using the base. Right? You can plug it in there. You can plug it in there. Okay. And that gives you better performance, but all the results you have so far don't use it. Uh, the next one is 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 that is there in the paper where you st if you start the random box from the seed nodes only, then the false positive fall really, really low. Because there's no question of other works entering. Is only walks leaking out, which is much, much lesser. 
So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so finally, um, just to summarize this, so you're starting with the HoneyNet node, and you have the peer-to-peer -peer network containing the HoneyNet nodes, and then you apply this sort of anomaly, graph-based anomaly or misbehavior detection test. It's so basically a statistical significance test, you can call it. Uh, in the paper, there's also a privacy-preserving mechanism which allows multiple ISPs to do that collaboratively without actually sharing the traces to e with each other. But, you know, it becomes too big, so I just left it out. And it's sort of a different topic, too. Uh, just a high-level question. Uh, when you are adding these edges, or yeah. rather, you know, when do you consider that these are uh, sort of belonging to a connection, like who talks to whom, yeah. uh, how do you decide that? Like, is it just, you know, one packet from one source to a destination enough? That's enough. If that's enough, then as a botnet master, I would, I mean, I could be, in theory, uh, just send random packets to random destinations to, you know, make sure that you think that they are also part of this botnet or something. No, no, but that's already sort of there. You already have client-server connections from the infected hosts to the other parties in the internet. You're adding a few random nodes from here isn't really going to change things all that much. Unless, of course, you can. Perhaps if you massively inject, increase the size, maybe it will. Yes, yes. Right, in that case, uh, your short walk, when you, are, when you have detected all these bands, and then now you're trying to detect whether they are boldness or not, then your short walks could actually end up on that on those random destinations that I have sent these packets to, yes. and then now your false positive name is not going to be this call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you send sufficiently high amounts of this thing, then yes, that's possible. You're right. So then you would need to go to higher levels, I guess. You hit the limits of ground consideration. Yeah, I think so. So, so at that point, you just find out nodes with more than a million degree and you just take them. Yeah, you could do that. You could do that. You could do that, or you could combine it now with behavioral techniques. Yes. And then go with that. They can fly under the radar, right? The threshold based thing. So you send enough packets to random hosts just so that you cannot eliminate them. Yeah. So I think, I mean, the part of, you know, trying to prevent graph based algorithms from doing that partitioning. What is the minimum sort of defense budget you need to have and what are the strategies by which you make graph partitioning algorithms to fail is a very interesting question with much wider applications than just this. For instance, you want to prevent Google from snooping at you and figuring out which subset of friends they class you into or what communities they class you into, then you could use that as a privacy preserving technique on a graph as well. There are many more important applications than this. But you're right, I haven't looked at how easy it is for bot masters to overcome bot grep. I suspect I it's not that tough. Wondering, would it, these are UDP connections or UDP packets or just TCP? Protocol uh, IP. It's just IP. Yeah, the IP. Okay, so last. Yeah, let's you, that yes, let's wrap up. Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, the basic uh, take home message is graph algorithms are useful. So far, a lot of machine learning algorithms have been used. Graph algorithms are also useful. And hybrid of them is probably what is what is actually needed. Uh, so inter ISP cooperation is useful for security. We all already know that. Here's one more reason. And uh, finally, stealth and robustness seem to be inversely related, right? So that's that's my very good question. Yeah. Um, so uh, P2P software. Can you do the upside? Yeah, we're going to be doing a very soft Thanks. Next time, speakers. Thank you.